listening to The Cooler Ring, a podcast made for manufacturing marketers. Here are Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Welcome to The Cooler Ring, a podcast for manufacturing marketers brought to you by Cooler Partners. My name is Jeff White and joining me today is Carmen Perry. Carmen, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. Nice. Looking forward to uh, a lot of recordings today. <laughs> yeah. We're in the studio. Yeah, it's one of those rack and stack kind of recording days. So it's good. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, this is the first though. So, our, you know, we should uh, we shouldn't be, you know, sounding particularly raspy or anything. Uh, Not yet. If our if our uh, questions seem uh, particularly bad or that our brains aren't working, well, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> We've had enough espresso, hopefully, to curb that potential, and you know, we could take up smoking between now and the next one to really get the raspiness underway. I am on it. <laughs> But I am looking forward to uh, to our guest today. It's an interesting topic and one we haven't really covered on the show before, but we have encountered with a, a few clients in the past. Yeah, and it is, it's just a common challenge in the manufacturing space, but at one that people don't like to talk about at parties, I think, or something. <laughs> I don't know what parties you're going to. You know what I mean? But, but it's, um, you know... It, so you know, it, it takes a bit of uh, so, so. So, guys, I guess that what we're talking about today is kind of the challenge of commoditization, and you know, to, to talk about it means you have to almost there at least needs to be an admission that there is a commoditization in the space. I find it's, it's interesting to see how some people won't even go there; like they won't even allow themselves to imagine that that's what they're encountering. So, heaven forbid, we actually begin to solve the solve the problem. But today's guest uh, is. Uh, Hook, line, and sinker into this. I'm really interested. Yeah, in, working towards it. Yeah, let's let's, uh, let's jump in. For sure. So joining us today is Matthew Seymour. Matthew is the VP of Marketing at Hyperion Materials and Technologies. Welcome to the Cooler Ring, Matt. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. Glad to be here early in your day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it like, only gets worse. Yeah, exactly. It's like the surgeon's first patient or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to be the first. I don't know. Day. I mean, of the day. Not of first day. ever. No. Know, of the day. <laughs> We want to come to this fresh. <laughs> Matt, um, uh, tell us a, a bit about yourself and uh, and Hyperion, if you would. So, so I'm I'm Matt Seymour, uh, the VP of Marketing at Hyperion Materials and Technologies. Uh, I ha- am I am a marketer at heart, but I've always been in the industrial space. Uh, so that's why I love this podcast so much. It really hits that uh, that that topic. Uh, Hyperion uh, Materials and Technologies is an industrial manufacturer of hard and super hard materials, uh, generally for tooling, production lines, specialty components, uh, primarily diamond and cemented carbide. So when you when you go when you get get your drill that's a diamond tipped drill or a carbide drill for cutting through through hard materials, uh, that's the type of thing that we make. Although more for the industrial tooling and industrial manufacturing market, not 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 really the home market. Right. And and Hyperion comes from General Electric, who is uh, the company that invented the. Um, the artificial diamond for industrial use. So we have a long history of that. So uh, to the topic of commoditization, this was not a commodity uh, 40, 50 years ago when it was invented. Uh, And and we still don't think it's a commodity, uh, but the market starts to see it in a more commoditized view. And uh, again, like I say, I mean, if that's happening to something that's as cool sounding as like, you know, diamond cutting things, right? It's like, I don't know. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I remember when I worked at, uh, at, uh, for an electric utility and we had a, um, one of our hydroelectric dams um, uh, was under some kind of interesting kind of cement swelling conditions that uh, were not anticipated. And there had to be a, a specialty diamond saw that uh, is basically taking thin slices out of the dam while keeping the dam uh, to, to, to reduce the pressure while still keeping it there, which, you know, frankly, sounds like the furthest thing from a commodity. Um, uh, it sounds just really cool, but as I appreciate what you said uh, there, Matt, around it's not like it actually is a pure play commodity, but the market is seeing it in a more commodity. And I think you framed it the right way there, um, because that saw itself is, is definitely not a commodity, but the diamond that goes into that saw, there, there are a lot of suppliers of that diamond. 
and, and a lot of suppliers who are trying to, to make it seem like, hey, all, all, all diamond is, is the same. And that's just really not the case. When, when you come at it from that perspective, you know, one of your competitors or suppliers who are, you know, they're trying to make it seem like a commodity, one would assume because their product is not necessarily at the same level, say, as Hyperion's, for example. You know, how, how do you tell the story about how you don't necessarily envision it in that way? Yeah, that's, that's really the core uh, of what we have to do. Right. And, and it's all about having that that value messaging. Right. Um, you know, there there's always the quantitative side of the value messaging and making sure that that sales teams and easy visibility to the customer in terms of that quantitative value. I mean, when we talk about when we talk about that, that sawing example, you need to make sure that saw doesn't dull so you can get those small pieces of, of, of concrete out of out of the dam where the swelling is. Uh, and you can get to those quantitative uh, um, numbers through really good testing. But the truth of the matter is those are hard to communicate. So it really needs to be a combination of quantitative uh, measures and qualitative justifiers and really being able to build up those justifiers as an organization, things related to customer service, related to additional value propositions like supply chain security. I think those become really core messages as you're as you're talking about your product line in comparison to uh, to other product lines. That's a really nice and concise way of talking about that. That notion of quantitative value messaging. Yes, you have to do it. Kind of sometimes hard to hard to get that information, and sometimes harder to communicate. Qualitative justifying. It really kind of gives the so what. And as well, I'm guessing in some ways opens up the appetite to be able to digest the quantitative value messaging. Yeah, and and the quantitative value messaging, the, the challenge of it is, is there's always, you have to have really tight data behind it. And if your data is, even if your data is tight, your competitor's data might not be tight, but they may be trying to say the same things from a quantitative perspective because your customers can't always digest that data in an effective way. So uh, having those qualitative justifiers really allows you to take that to the next level. And despite them being qualitative, they're still solid and firm when you talk about things like supply chain, uh, customer experience, ease of doing business, ease of engagement, responsiveness, all of these things, while uh, traditionally uh, industrial companies focus on the values of their product, some of these broader values of, of the company can really help drive home the value of the quantitative side as well. I, I really, you know, I, we see that a lot, especially in, you know, kind of high technology um, industrial applications where there, you know, there's a lot of competition, speeds and feeds, I think is, you know, you hear that a lot, certainly in, uh, in IT and tech, you know, but the softer side of that is interesting because, you know, it removing the commoditization through the lens of the relationship and the stability of the product offering is a really interesting way to kind of distance yourself from somebody just comparing well this one is supposed to last as long as that one and it's just as you know has just as much hardness as uh, as theirs but uh, maybe they can't get it and keep it in stock exactly it's it's that it's that message of well, they're saying the same thing that you're saying about, about the product itself. And even if technically not true, perception becomes reality in that, in that case. And, and keeping it in stock, I mean, hey, that, that's, a, that's a perfect one with, with the demands and especially post-COVID, right? Post-COVID, post the supply chain issues that people had uh, with, with COVID and with China, a supply chain and being able to keep it in stock is really, really critical. And, and that's whether the product comes from, uh, from the US, whether it comes from Europe, whether it comes from Asia, you're still having the item in stock is sometimes more important than an extra, you know, 
three days of runtime on a product. Mm. You think that advantage goes away once we've kind of gotten past the, maybe we'll never get past these supply chain issues, but, uh, you know, do you think that uh, reliance on, uh, on supply chain stability becomes less of a selling feature once people get a bit more stability throughout the global economy? I think that there will be at, at, a, at a point some distance from it. But it's going to be something that still lingers uh, in in people's memories. I think, okay, COVID is certainly going to be something that we remember how it impacted our businesses for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, And companies have gotten more competitive in in things like the supply chain topic by relocating some of their supply chain to more accessible locations. But I think we'll also come to a a balance point of companies trying to level out their inventory again, too. Companies built up a lot of stock during this period so that they weren't impacted by supply chain issues. So as they start to lower those stocks down, I think we're 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 going to to hit that risk point again where the message helps reaffirm their decision to lower stock, knowing that they have a partner with a more stable supply chain. I'm wondering, as you think about this um, uh, qualitative justifying messaging uh, side of side of your messaging strategy, do you? Um, there, I mean, the supply chain is kind of an interesting one to kind of uh, pull on a little bit because it it's speaking to a kind of a market condition, um, you know, that will ebb and flow its in importance over time. So I would assume in your messaging, you may put it into the window or take it out of the window a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, over time, but depending on uh, the extent to which it's a priority in the market. Uh, but then there are other uh, qualitative justifications, I'm assuming, that are, as you mentioned earlier, maybe a little bit more tied to corporate values, long-term corporate positioning, um, heritage of the firm, et cetera, the, the things that are a, a little bit more, if you will, part of the DNA and not just something we choose to talk about because it's advantageous right now. Do you think about split consciously or is it just kind of what happens to be working? I'll be honest, I would say I prob- we probably don't think about that split consciously, but but that split is is really clearly there. I mean, I look at a company like mine, which is Hyperial Materials and Technologies. Uh, we, we are also a technology company, even though we sell metal and diamond, right? And being able to uh, lean on that heritage of a company that experience in 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 developing uh, new products even if the customer sees that product today as as being somewhat interchangeable with others um, having justifiers like a history of technological development sustainability and I think sustainability continues to be an important key message uh, really heavily in in Europe right now, but also in 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 the Americas and in Asia, being able to be a supportive partner in in recycling and creating that kind of uh, that circular life cycle of of the product. All of these things, um, as as an industrial manufacturer, are are important to our customer and our customers' customers. Beyond the messaging uh, Matt, I'm wondering uh, how else this uh, uh, battle against commoditization happens to come to life in your world I think I think there were are really two other major places um, one of them is is in first party data and really making sure that as a company we don't just understand our customers but we understand our non-customers too people buying products like ours, um, but but not yet buying from us. I think having a, a, a well-cleaned, well-managed, and well-developed set of first-party data really helps a, a, a company to understand who it is that are the commodity buyers 
and who it is that aren't the commodity buyers. And it's not as simple as this industry tends to buy on, a, 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 it as a commodity and this industry tends to, tends to look at the value add. Some of this is really on a person by person, company by company basis, which is one of those places where it's really critical that marketing works with sales uh, to understand these potential customers, uh, engage with them, document effectively in the CRM what non-customers are buying on so that you can tailor messages to even convert some of those customers that are, or those non-customers that are commodity buyers uh, to act more like the value added buyers that are in the same industry or the same target segment that you've built out. This is... Um... I'm, I'm kind of being reminded of there's it happens a lot of manufacturing marketing where you'll have uh, people that sell big um, like large equipment purchases and they have a, a split difference in their in their uh, target uh, uh, base uh, people who are uh, exclusively focused on capex and so it's it's got to be the lowest cost of acquisition of that you know, like capital expenditure has to be as low as possible and then there's kind of total cost of ownership buyers and they are very different beasts very different procurement animals they think about they just the what they value is different as organizations and you're right it doesn't always just break down around oh well this industry is just chock full of uh um of uh total cost of ownership style buyers that are more sophisticated etc and this industry is chock full of something else it, it always is a mix and almost at a company by company level and it, it does make that first party data really is the secret sauce, isn't it? But you have to have the discipline and the, the um, budget to, to do it. Like you have to care about it. There's a technology play there. Yeah. In order to manage that. Yeah. And, and Carmen, to that, that point, you, if you have your first party data correct, then you might even be able to find that one total cost of ownership influencer at a company that that generally buys based on based on the initial investment and if you can get that guy on your side uh you can make those inroads especially if you have really good examples within that first party data of how you uh drove a lower upfront cost before the total cost of ownership within that same segment, right? Using the segment to model and then really dig in and target drives uh, drives real value for this kind of sales to marketing connection or marketing to sales connection, really. Marketing being able to help make that connection to make it easier for your sales guys to get, get in the door. But, but you guys are right. There is a, a huge discipline issue that you have and making sure that all of this data is maintained on a regular basis, making sure that your systems are able to hold that data. But if you get the system set up right and train and train the teams right, you can really get some incredible insights that help you find the right buyers at your potential customers. All right. Well, that's uh, you said there were two. First party data was number one. So that was really cool. Let's, let's go on to number two. Number two is being easy to do business with. I think uh, when when you're looking at commodity type buyers, and and even if those commodity type buyers are not your target market, um, being able to be a substitution for them when they have, for example, a supply chain problem, when they run out of stock and their regular supplier just can't get to them fast enough being able to be an easy substitution for that kind of first time buy maybe they've never bought from you they're looking for uh product x and you have product x.2 something that's close enough for their for their application and they just need to get that it can't be hard for them to do business with you right it can't be that they have to go through a, a long period of, of val validation as, as a new customer. They need to be that, that customer that can just engage, buy a couple, a couple pieces of product X.2, and you're, and you're good to go. Because then they get that first taste of your product. They start to see that differentiation where you really have that, that added value. So being easy to do business with being easy to acquire that 
first sale at a new customer who might not be normally within your expected target group is critical. How do you do that? Because I mean, it, it obviously sales is involved in that, marketing is involved in that, but things start to change when you you know you got to put somebody in your ERP and you got to stand them up that way. Like how how do you onboard someone in a way that makes them go, "Wow, that was really easy." Like we should buy more from these people. It's it's tough. Um, I, <laughs> I, 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 wish, I wish I could give your listeners a really clear answer to that one, uh, but I think it's one of the critical challenges of, of us as, as business to business marketers trying to, uh, trying to steal share from, uh, from, from commodity, commodity vendors. I, I think, you know, you look at a company like um, like Amazon. In fact, a lot of companies where they have an e-commerce platform and, and it's a relatively simpler, straightforward e-commerce platform. So making, making that, uh, that journey for the customer on their own through the products as simple as possible, allowing a guest type check out with a credit card makes just a huge difference on a first on a first transaction. Look, you still have to get all of their information acquired at that point because you're going to be shipping a product to them. Um, but if you can if you can simplify that very first transaction, you set up the sales team for success and engagement and following up with that customer afterwards. And maybe that customer doesn't become a regular customer of yours, but if you've given them such a simple way to make an, a first time transaction, then maybe they always come back to you as their secondary supplier of choice. And, and being in that position for somebody who uh, would not normally select your product is, is really an excellent place to be in. Additionally, if, the reason they're coming to you is because of the uh, ease of getting getting your product. You, us as a not not us, but any value added customer can can make a little additional margin on that because now you're selling the product to them with that very clear additional value of the supply chain. It becomes not just a justifier, but it is the decision making process for that person when they're coming to you. I, I I think this is really um, you know I think people think we experience it all the time as uh, as consumers of course I mean if you're a, a cola drinker and you like Coke and you're at the restaurant or whatever and you order Coke and you're like, yeah we, we have Pepsi do you want Pepsi um, you know they only have one or the other and it's that time when somebody tries you experience that as a consumer but you don't always think about it as a manufacturing marketer and that notion of okay kind of in similar ways what are we doing to get that that substitution trial well it's about making uh, that first order easy and being easy to do business with i think that's really great ad advice matt do you put more is, do, do you get to apply some level of kind of marketing effort into the the early onboarding or what happens in those first phases of being a customer. So when they are first receiving the product or, or what have you, is there a, it seems to me that that might be a pretty interesting opportunity. I, th I think that is an interesting opportunity. I, I will say uh, that's not something I've been deeply involved in. Um, uh, we've done uh, over, over my career, uh, inbox marketing, for example. So when the customer first receives their uh, their their product, uh, they get some sort of additional message to go with it. Also, a great way to sell consumables or or um, corollary complementary products that that might go with something. Um, but you're absolutely right that that first kind of engagement between the customer and their newly purchased product, their newly connected vendor really does become, become critical. Early in my career, uh, I was a telemarketer. And as a telemarketer, uh, one of the, the best things that you can do is you have a positive conversation with a, custom, with a potential customer, you send them a LinkedIn connection. Of course, this is industrial business to business. Most of, most of these people have LinkedIn. And, and then the next time you, you talk to them, you have that initial 
connection that they actually know you. You're not just a phone, a, a number, a name on the phone or a voice on the phone. And I think that's the same thing for, for the the product after after that first sale. You're not just the product. You need to find a way to become the company that that supports them. And um, I, I once worked for for Disney, and one of the things that that they told us as uh, uh, as as new cast members there is that you're not competing just against uh, just against the other amusement parks in the area, right? You're competing against uh, every cash register that a person comes up against. When our phone team is competing against every experience that the person has calling customer service on the phone. And I think thinking that way um, helps set you apart. I mean, that's why Apple's box opening is such an experience, right? It gives you that connection to the product even before you see the product for the first time. Um, I think that's a place a lot of in, uh, industrial marketers could uh, could learn and focus from. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting um, uh, bit of instruction here around what part of the customer journey to focus on, um, where to apply the marketing horsepower, and uh, to, to, to beat commoditization. And this has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, Matt, any, uh, I, I'm kind of I hesitate to, to end the conversation, but we do have to do that at some point. I wonder, is there any kind of parting advice for our Listeners who may be dealing with this uh, same challenge, anything that maybe has you excited for the coming year as a new way of dealing with this challenge, potentially? I actually think that you guys framed it well at the beginning, right? People don't talk about it. People don't talk about it because they don't uh, want to admit that their product is commoditizing but you could admit that the market is it has has a commoditization factor without admitting that your product is commoditizing because I, I will say it our product is is not a commodity most of, of of your listeners their product even if they're in a commoditizing market their product is not a commodity their product our product is a value added product and it's critical that we make sure as marketers that we, we let the market know about it. But you also have to be able to comfortably recognize you're competing in a different environment than if you're competing against other value added sellers. And I think as long as we as marketers and going into, going into next year, start thinking about how we talk about it internally, it's going to help us drive our marketing message and focus that marketing message that helps our sales teams grow, helps our revenue grow, and helps our margins. Fantastic, Matt. Thank you for joining the Cooler Ring. It's been uh, wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Cooler Ring with Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Don't miss a single manufacturing marketing insight. Subscribe now at coolapartners.com slash thecoolerring. That's K-U-L-A partners.com slash the cooler ring.